So Pika, I see you have regained your enthusiasm for making videos. Uh, yeah, uh, don't know how long it's gonna last though, cause, uh, you know, these things kinda come in spurts. Are you ready for some whinging and hypocrisy? Yeah, go on then, do your worst. Um, BBC football coverage. I, uh, I'm not in my comfort zone here, really. Just give it a minute. When we don't play by the rules, there are penalties to pay. And it's the same for countries. The US has placed penalties on Iran since the revolution back in 1979. Oh. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. Roll intro, motherfuckers. They say these sanctions are aimed at the government, not the people. That's because they are, and actions against a state always have a knock-on effect against the populace regardless of how carefully crafted sanctions are. And if they are gonna moan about sanctions against countries, I don't recall them moaning about the sanctions placed on South Africa during the time of apartheid, or the numerous sanctions placed by UN member nations including the US and UK against Libya, Iraq, China, Syria, and Lebanon etc. over the past 50 years plus. Now now lads, we all know that the BBC is completely impartial and doesn't have any kind of hidden agendas or anything like that, and definitely no biases, and they definitely don't try and convey political messages in their, you know, news broadcasts. Using these five things, I'm going to show you how sanctions are affecting Iranians day-to-day -day lives. Using Semtex I'm going to demonstrate how the Iranian state's funding of terrorism affects everybody else's daily lives. Isn't doing that a bit illegal? No, it's highly illegal. Medicine has become harder and more expensive to get hold of. Sanctions are not supposed to apply to medical supplies, but they do indirectly. Some drug suppliers are now refusing to sell to Iran to avoid falling foul of the US. Yeah, because when trade embargoes are placed on a country, um, anyone else, being another country or even a company, or even an individual who breaks this trade embargo can end up being in a lot of trouble. Uh, the problem with medical supplies is that many of the ingredients um, used in medical supplies can also be converted, you know, rendered down into uh, stuff that you can use to make weapons with. Uh, it might sound daft, but that is the case. And these companies that won't sell, you know, products or ingredients to Iran, you know, they're just hedging their bets. They don't want to be the company that sold stuff to Iran, which Iran then uses to make nerve gas or explosives or, you know, even nuclear weapons in some cases. This has led to shortages, putting thousands of lives at risk. There are people suffering from cancer, epilepsy or haemophilia who are struggling to get treatment. While I do indeed feel sorry for people who genuinely need these medications, the problem is, is that states and companies have little to no control over what happens to these chemicals once they have been handed over. And Iran can't even make its own versions of some of these drugs, because it's difficult to import the essential ingredients. Washington, on the other hand, says corruption and mismanagement are to blame. Yeah, the problem, like we've already said, is that the, you know, the company or the state that's selling, you know, kind of what will be classed as essential, uh, essential goods, you know, medications or the ingredients to make these medications, uh, if we if we sell them to Iran, uh, we have absolutely no control over um, what happens to them after they've gone to Iran. It's not like we're selling cardboard boxes full of stuff to Iran as a state. The, the problem is that we're selling them to individuals or individual companies within within Iran. And uh, once they've got them, they can pretty much do whatever they want with them. Uh, you know, some people will hold on to essential medications to charge vastly inflated prices for them. Others can use the medications for, you know, medications or chemicals for making weapons and things like that. This is the problem. It's it, This is just a case of kind of, you know, it's the kind of think of the children argument. You know, um, 
they're saying, you know, oh, well, you know, we can't, we're not selling this stuff, so, you know, think of the people that need these medications and stuff like that. It's like, well, we are, in, in essence, selling medication because there are still, you know, avenues to get these things that they need. It's just that, um, you know, people have to be careful uh, that they don't end up getting misused and stuff like that, you know. Uh, it can be horrible for a company to, you know, like I said earlier, you know, to be the company that sold the stuff that Iran Iranians used to make nerve gas. It can also be horrible for a company to sell stuff to, you know, an individual or a business. Uh, you know, say cancer medications. They can sell cancer medications to an individual or a business, uh, which then, you know, quadruples the price to sell them on. And, you know, it gets a, a headline in the newspapers or... Oh, Company X dealing with disgusting, you know, warlord or something like that. You know, it, it, this isn't a, a thing that's strictly, uh, you know, it's strictly unique to Iran, uh, you know, or business with Iran. Um, it happens in parts of Africa. You know, it's like I say, the governments, uh, you know, governments can be corrupt. There are people there who want to line their own pockets, or who will appropriate things uh, when they come into the country for their own personal use. Uh, you know, it's like I say, you know, you get all these banana republics and, and things like that, you know, with warlords and stuff, and the warlords find out that there's a shipment of food coming in, so what do they do? They send their heavy mob over to grab the food and uh, keep it for themselves, and it never gets to where it's going. You see, this is one of the problems here that the BBC is not considering while they're busy virtue signalling. They're so old. They still have ashtrays in the armrests. Okay, I'm going to quickly deal with this one. This section they go on at length moaning about how the Iranian state airline is still using planes from the 70s. But after a part of the trade embargo was lifted, they ordered some newer aircraft from Airbus. Ten of these were delivered before new embargoes were placed on Iran, meaning that they still have a lot of old aircraft in their fleet. Funny thing is however, that both parts of the Iranian Air Force are equipped with many modern aircraft, some purchased from Russia and China, some developed by themselves, mostly using stolen engineering specs from western aircraft. If they can afford to spend a shit ton of money on developing and maintaining modern aircraft, then they can afford to develop and maintain their own passenger aircraft, but that's what you get for living in a theocratic military dictatorship. Iran is dealing with ink shortages, and the price of imported paper has more than tripled since the US pulled out of the nuclear deal. Let's be honest, this is a minor problem, and when I say minor, I mean it's pretty much irrelevant. If they want ink and paper, they should be able to make their own, after all. Before the revolution, Iran was an up-and-coming modern country. But since it became an Islamic fundamentalist state, which has openly declared its burning hatred of the West and by extension, all non-Muslim countries, then it's rather surprising how they still wish to continue trading for things with the infidels. Not only that, but this section says how newspaper publishers have taken a hit, when, let's be honest, most news these days, including in the Middle East, is distributed via television or the internet. The problem there being is that Iran is a very controlling and pro-censorship state. TV and internet are limited in what people can see, so the loss of a few print newspapers, who are also subject to the limitations placed on them by the state, is in reality not much of a loss, and therefore, not our problem. Journalists and publishers say this situation will make it even harder to hold the government to account. I mean, not that that does them any good anyway. Um with Iran being a pro-censorship state, journalists that are there have to be extremely careful about what they say, um, even if they, you know, are implying something in their reports, either, you know, television or newspaper or whatever. Uh, if the state takes a dislike to what they're saying, then they'll probably find themselves being locked up, beaten, tortured, or maybe even, you know, dead. Um, Supplying ink and paper to Iran is not going to solve that problem. Uh, you know, the, the main problem is the state itself. And I, I really don't get why they complain about this. You know, oh, we can't hold the state to account. If enough people in the country don't like the state how it is, you know, the, there was a revolution in Iran which overthrow, you know, saw the overthrow of the Shah. 
and replaced him with uh, Ayatollah Ruala, was it Ruala Homini? I think it is Ayatollah Homini. Uh, the Shah wasn't very well liked, he was a bit of a cunt. Um, so the Islamic Revolution took place and they replaced him with Ayatollah Homini, uh, who a lot of people don't like, and you know, he's died now and they replaced him with another Ayatollah, who name I just cannot remember. Um, but the state is still a basically a theocratic military dictatorship. People there don't like it, you know, and um, there's there's nothing stopping them from having another revolution, but they won't do it. Um, the the Iran has basically been belligerent since it became the you know the Islamic Republic of Iran, and um, you know they they've done all sorts of stuff. They've backed terrorists. Uh, there's been hostage crises. Uh, you know, they, they've done all sorts of stuff to be belligerent towards the West. And now we've got this BBC journalist moaning about it. You know, it's like she said at the beginning of the video, you know, you do things, there are consequences. And unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that she's moaning about are complete consequences of Iran being a complete arsehole to the rest of the world. You know, we do the same stuff with Korea. You know, Korea is a, an arsehole to the rest of the world. Um, but you don't hear people coming on to moan about that. You know, you don't have a journalist on the BBC coming to moan about the problems that Korea has with all the sanctions and embargoes and stuff like that placed against it. This, a kilo of red meat, has become a luxury in Iran. It used to cost 10 US dollars before the new sanctions kicked in. Now it's more than double that price. Okay, so I just did some uh, calculations based on, you know, recent food prices and currency exchange and things like that. And in the UK, uh, the cost of one kilogram of red meat, which is beef, uh, costs £7.50, which when you convert that into dollars, uh, comes out at about $9.12. Uh, so yeah, it's actually quite cheaper here for red meat, and this is because we produce our own. Um, so I, I I don't understand why they're importing beef into the country um, and not raising their own. You know, buying a, a few cow. You know, maybe buying a few cows and starting a you know state cattle ranch or something like that would be a better idea than spending money on making copies of uh, American. Um, you know, drone aircraft. No sympathy whatsoever here. Well, I, I do. People are hungry and starving, uh, but the state that they live in, that's supposedly so brilliant, um, allows them to starve because they're too busy spending money on weapons. Nearly a quarter of all restaurants in Tehran have shut down, and rationing has been reintroduced for the first time since the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s. Any country that has a nuclear program can afford to ensure that its citizens get fed, instead of buying up yellow cake uranium, to enrich to make nuclear weapons, try buying grain and cows instead, you know, like what other countries have to do. Yeah, this is a first world problem. This section moans about how they can't use Uber and instead had to come up with their own equivalent but then has a good whinge about how the app they created themselves isn't available on the Apple Store. Fuck off. This isn't a problem worth any amount of time or interest. Whilst both Tehran and Washington blame each other for the sanctions, try convincing ordinary Iranians that these sanctions are not actually aimed at them. Like the populace of most countries, the average Iranian probably wouldn't understand the nuance of the various problems which have led to the US and other countries placing sanctions and trade embargoes against Iran. Um, the main problem at the moment with Iran <clears throat> is that the nuclear deal, which they, they moaned about Donald Trump pulling out of, the, the one that was set up by Obama, uh, was basically the the Obama deal basically allowed uh, Iran to begin developing its nuclear weapons program, as Iran has quite categorically stated, or the government of Iran has quite categorically stated on numerous occasions that they despise the Western countries with a passion, um, allowing such a country to have access to uh, one of the world's worst weapons of mass destruction is not a good idea. 
and you know we should try and stop them from you know acquiring this stuff um to the average joe in the street in iran yes this might have the knock-on effects but the problem is not with the actual embargoes themselves the problem is with the government who is basically trying to blow up the world um you know recent developments in the you know iran region with the the hijacking of uh, ships and things like that have just gone to show how iran is is still belligerent towards us they they claim they do it under self-defense or you know, oh, they drifted into our, our territorial waters and we had no option but to basically grab the ship and hold the crew hostage and, you know, try and ransom off it or whatever. You know, this is the sort of behaviour that's exhibited by uh, Somali pirates, you know, and um, the the world, you know, both the US and the UK navies have ships out patrolling that particular part of the world to deal with Somali pirates. And, uh, you know, but when Iran gets belligerent and starts doing stuff like that, people moan that, you know, oh, just look at it from their side. There's no excuse for building nuclear weapons after declaring that you hate everybody. There's no excuse for hijacking cargo ships or whatever, or oil tankers. Um, it's just basically been a, a, a bunch of complete cunts, which that's what Iran has been ever since the Islamic Revolution. And... Uh, for some reason, they can't get it through their head that when you start being a twat to somebody, they're going to be a twat back. You know, it's they can take, they can give it out, but they can't take it. Um, so yeah, that that brings this video to a close. Once again, the BBC has used the license payers' money to produce bullshit journalism again. Um, there's so many things wrong with the BBC's news coverage of stuff like this. This uh, turned up on the. I think it was the BBC News uh, YouTube feed. Uh, I'll put a link to the full video in the description below uh, so you can watch it without the edits I've made to it because I've made quite a few edits just for brevity. Um, but yeah, the up on screen now we have my uh, thingy details. If you wish to make a donation to me via my PayPal, please feel free to do so. Uh, any money uh, received is received with uh, thanks and will be put to good use on various things uh, that I'm doing at the moment, you know, living expenses. Plus, if you like the channel and want to keep it going, it goes towards paying the, the internet bill and, and all stuff like that. Um, so, yes, thank you for watching. If you've made it this far, I really do appreciate it. And I will see you next time.